Welcome to C++ for Java Programmers. I'm Professor Caleb. In this video, I want to talk about arrays in C++. We'll only talk about statically allocated arrays today. We'll discuss how we might manage dynamically allocated arrays in a later video. Array declarations in C++ are somewhat similar to Java's, but the differences are important. We have the type, then the name of the array variable, and then square brackets containing the size, ending with a semicolon as always. Notice that the brackets and size must follow the array variable name in C++ always. So this creates an array of 10 integers named score. And this creates an array of num items doubles. Note that the size of the array must be a constant. We can't use a variable because the size of the array is actually determined at compile time. There are some important things to notice here. First, we don't use new. We're not doing something dynamic. Just as declaring an int variable gives me an integer variable to work with, declaring the score array gives me an array of 10 integers, all ready for use. If we leave out the size, we're going to get an error on modern compilers. Note that on older compilers, we could actually end up with an array with zero items. So don't leave out the size. This is particularly important because there's no way to change the size of the array. The only way to get a different size is to recompile the program. So you always need to make sure that you're aware of that reality. We also need to be aware that C++ arrays have no bounds checking built in. None. They don't know how big they are. You may have heard of buffer overflows. C++ is a language where they're easy to do because I can walk right off the end of my array into other parts of memory. Sometimes that won't seem to do anything bad to my program. Sometimes it'll crash the program. Sometimes it'll create weird logic errors. The same program might do any of the above on different runs. Talk about potential security and reliability issues. C++, be very, very careful using your arrays to make sure you don't allow your code to go outside the array bounds. You have to be responsible for that. You have to keep up with how big your arrays actually are. Now the good news is that there are some familiar things about C++ arrays for Java programmers. They use zero-based indices, just like Java. We'll also access individual array elements in exactly the same way. So if we think of this as the score array. We can see the indices run from 0 to 9 since it's a 10 element array, just as we would expect. And to access the third element, we would use score, square brackets 2, getting this 10 here. Let's talk about initializing arrays. The first thing to note is that arrays are not automatically initialized for you in C++. When we create the score array, we don't know what the values in it are. They're generally whatever was in memory where the array was created, just as is true with other local variables. We should also be aware that C++ doesn't necessarily warn us that we didn't initialize the variables, array or otherwise. Some compilers might, others won't. And any warnings will be just that, warnings, not errors. As with other potential issues, we're going to end up with logic errors rather than compile time errors. So our errors can be more challenging to find. We can initialize arrays with syntax similar to what we use in Java. Note that this is the one exception to not having empty brackets. If we leave the square brackets empty, the size will match the size of the initialization list. So in this particular case, we would end up with five characters in a five character long array. We can still specify the size of the array, in which case our initialization list needs to be no longer than the specified array size. If it's smaller than the array, then the remaining values will be filled in with zeros. So here we have the first four values as specified and the remaining six are zeros. We can use this to initialize even very large arrays to zero by just providing an initial value of zero. So what happens is the first value gets the zero and the other 99 get the automatic zero because we initialized anything. So all 100 values are zero. 
But don't let this get confusing. Sometimes people will think that they can get away with this and have it initialize everything to one because it works for zero. However, what's actually going to happen here is the first value will be initialized to one and the remainder will be zero. So if you want to initialize large array to all ones, just as in Java, you're going to want to write a loop. I do want to mention multidimensional arrays. Like Java, C++ does not have multidimensional arrays at this point, though there is some discussion of adding them to the language in the next revision. However, also like Java, you can create arrays of arrays, and arrays of arrays of arrays, and so on. That will look like this. So matrix is a 3 by 4 array of integers, and air 3 d is a 10 by 10 by 10 array. Again, all of these values must be specified at compile time and won't change. So let's talk just a minute about arrays as parameters. Here's an example of a function header that accepts a one-dimensional array. We don't specify a length for the array. As long as the array has integers, we can pass it to this function if it's one dimension. Note that the num items is needed. In Java, we sometimes want to specify how many items we want to process, but if we're using the whole array all the time, we can rely on the array's length. In C++, the array doesn't know how big it is. We don't have anything that will tell us this is how long this array is. So we absolutely need the num items parameter to tell us how many items to process. Of course, we can also pass multidimensional arrays as parameters. In that case, we must specify every dimension but the first one. And notice that we can pass arrays of different sizes here, but their underlying structure has to be the same, only the number of this largest dimension can change. Okay, let us go over and experiment with this just a little bit. I want to show off a few things. I've actually already set up a um, program, errorpractice.cpp. And so let me show you what I have here, and then we'll play with this a little bit. I especially want to show you some of the issues as far as buffer overflow and so forth. So um, we have our comment, we have our IO stream. I've set up two functions. Uh, the first one sets num items array values to all ones, so takes in the number of items to process and just sets them all to ones. And then one that prints out values, however many values you've specified. So those are pretty straightforward little uh, for loops. Then I've created three arrays in main. So the first one, they're all integer arrays to allow them us to work with them all more easily. First one, we have score 10 items that I've initialized the first four items. Then we have this all initialized that didn't specify how many items. So we should have a six item array that goes six, five, four, three, two, one. And then I went ahead and created a two-dimensional array, my stuff here, which I haven't initialized at all. I've gone ahead and used my print values method to print out some of these items. So I've got the score array, all 10 items. I've got the 10 items in the first row of my stuff and the 10 items in the second uh, row of my stuff. Note that um, I have to do this sort of one at a time. Obviously, I could have written a loop and printed the whole thing out. I didn't really want to print that much out. I, but we do have to pass a one-dimensional array as the parameter to the one-dimensional array here. OK, so let's go ahead and make sure this is compiled and then run it. So.
Okay, now, first thing to notice is that things are behaving as we would expect. So we printed out the scores array. The first three, first four values are the four values we specified. The next six are the zeros that we were promised. Then we have my stuff. Notice we didn't initialize my stuff. And we have random data in my stuff. Um, interestingly enough, we did get a couple of zeros here. But the rest of it is just sort of other stuff. And as expected, all initialized is all there. Now I want to look. So I want to see what is in all initialized, what we would get if we printed more of all initialized. So let's go ahead and print the first 10 of all initialized. So that should be running off the end of the array. Let's compile that and run it. And there are a couple of zeros here. Then we start getting some other data. We're going to see in a little bit that what's happening is the next thing after this is actually this array. So let's see what happens if we print uh, 30 here. 30, not 300. compile that and print. Uh, let's apparently save that and compile it and print. Okay, so we get the six things we'd expect. We get two zeros. Then we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This looks very much like this. Then we get a couple things we don't recognize, but then we get these items. And this is basically in memory where we're looking. What's going on here is the all initialized array is first, then we have some padding and the score array and then we have some padding or something else. And then we have the my stuff array. Now notice if you set this up, you may have totally different results because you're on a different computer, potentially using a different compiler. So if you're in a similar architecture using the same compiler, you should have similar results. But if you're on a different compiler, it may put things in a different order. But notice that just because they're in this order in my code doesn't mean they're going to be in that order in memory. So that makes it more challenging to figure out what we wrote on top of if we went outside of memory. I do want to actually look at what happens if we do some writing on top of. So let's go ahead and use this set error to ones method and I'm going to do 20 with score. So score obviously only has 10. We're going to be writing on other bits of memory. So let's see what happens. And in order to see what happens, let's copy our print down here. save that, and compile, and run. Now we see that the first row of the, the scores array is all ones, that the first row of our my stuff array is partly ones, and then the rest of it is untouched starting with these zeros. And if we come here, we'll see that if we look at the data from the all initialized array on, all initialized is the same, then we have the set of ones, including writing over those ones that were in the middle before, right? We had these 
zeros, then we had these other zeros, we had these values, all of that has become ones. So this is why we don't want to go outside our bounds. In this particular case, all it did was show us where things are changing, but not uh, show us, it, but didn't cause real problems. However, if we were actually trying to do things with these arrays, if we cared what their values were, uh, this would be an issue. And also don't forget, don't count on these being zeros. You're very used to that from Java. It's not true here. Okay, I encourage you to play with this some more, get on a computer, try some of these things out, uh, make sure that what I've said matches what you're finding. Thanks for watching. In the next video, I'll be talking about strings in C++.